you may begin. So I think we can start. Yes, thanks, Leticia. Hi, good evening, everybody. And thank you for taking the time to join us on this uh, webinar this evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Khalida Toki. I'm a nephrologist in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, and I am the co-chair of the um, uh, Young Nephrologist Committee under the African uh, Association of Nephrology. Um, so we're particularly happy to have this um, presentation today. Um, one of the mandates of the YNC, which is the Young Nephrologist Committee, is to produce this very practical approach to nephrology and give an opportunity for young nephrologists and young people in the field to be, be able to ask pertinent questions to experts. So I'm particularly happy to have this wonderful panel of experts today. I personally do not have much experience with peritoneal dialysis, so it'll be a, a lot of learning for me also. So I encourage everybody to ask their questions. And as we go along, please um, put in your questions in the chat box or in the Q&A box, and we'll be able to address them after the presentation. So really looking forward to this. Uh, I'm gonna begin by um, uh, uh, introducing my co uh, moderator, my senior role model and mentor, that is Professor Rasha Darvish. Uh, she's a consultant of internal medicine and nephrology at Cairo University, and she is the Afran elected treasurer, uh, treasurer and the, com the committee chair of the Afran PD committee. She's also an ISPD nominating committee member representing Middle East and Africa, ISN dialysis working group member representing Egypt and Africa, so this is uh, Professor Asha, welcome. And I think we have just a wonderful, wonderful panel going forward and just looking forward to just a wonderful discussion. Please take over. Thank you so much, Harida, for this very uh, nice introduction. And thank you all for preparing this webinar. I mean, activities and webinars in Afran are addition for every single um, member and participant. So thank you all. Uh, as you've just read in the advertising of this webinar, we are talking about peritoneal dialysis and we are tackling the subject of complications. I mean, we all know that complications, especially peritonitis with its different types, is the major um, kind of taboo or major factor which is frightening many of us nephrologists to approach PD. And we decided to, uh, actually the best way is to present a case, a clinical case, a personal experience and followed by a very good discussion by Dr. Nicola, who is going to discuss the complication and other complications which might be faced in peritoneal dialysis. Um, I am honored to present our first speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Walter Molloy. Dr. Molloy is a physician who completed his training fellowship through the College of Medicine uh, of South Africa with clinical rotations in both uh, at both at both Princess Marina Hospital, Gaboron, Botswana, and Grutishur Hospital, Cape Town, South Africa. And also he took a Master of Medicine through the University of Botswana. He obtained a subspeciality of clinical training and Master of uh, Philosophy in Adult Nephrology uh, at the Division of Nephrology and Hypertension at Grutishur Hospital through the University of Cape Town as well. Currently, he is a consultant physician and nephrologist at Gabron Private Hospital, Gabron, Botswana, and an adjunct senior lecturer at the Department of Medicine, University of Botswana, with a keen interest in end-stage kidney disease, glomerular diseases, and hypertension, and I hope also PD, Dr. Uh, Walter. So Dr. Walter is going to present our first case, and we're waiting to hear about it. Thank you so much. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for, for the kind introduction. I will share my slides. Is, is my slide visible on the other side? Yes, we can see it. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, it's a, it's a great honor for me to actually share this stage with uh, my distinguished professor, Professor Wayne, who is uh, the consultant, consultant expert for this case presentation. She will take over after I've presented the case to talk more about uh, what we're gonna talk about, which is encapsulating peritoneal uh, sclerosis. So I'm gonna go through a case of a gentleman that we actually treated here in Botswana. We've been in, in, in contact with this gentleman for many years, since about 2014. So this is my disclaimer for this presentation. Uh, our index patient is a 15 year old gentleman. He's a married father of two. He's an entrepreneur, farmer, and of sober habits. 
he has a background history of hypertension uh, diagnosed uh, in the mid 2000s and it was complicated by end stage kidney disease, which necessitated him studying on, on a kidney replacement therapy in 2014. He was started on CAPD in February 2014, and his treatment comprised of uh, FO exchanges. He's more standards for most patients at 1.5% PD free. He had a four to six hourly dwells and he slept intermittently dry or wet, depending on his fluid status. But he generally did very well and was very compliant with his treatment. And during his uh, treatment with uh, PD, he developed uh, two episodes of PD peritonitis, unfortunately. The first one about a year after starting treatment in 2015 with cognitive negative stuff, peritonitis. He was treated with vancomycin at the time, and uh, he had a repeat episode of the same organism. That was about uh, over a year later. Uh, that was the same organism with cognitive negative stuff, with PD peritonitis. He was treated at per PD peritonitis protocol. We don't have a history of exercise infections noted on this patient, but some of the complications that he later developed during his treatment. Uh, in 2018, that was about four years into his treatment, he started developing having this hemorrhagic effluent from his PD, and uh, that necessitated wake up for possible hemorrhagic uh, effluent. If, if we look for we look for bladder injury, which was not there. There was no evidence of pancreatitis. No malignancy, and he was accordingly switched from hemodialysis to period, from from PD to uh, hemodialysis in August of 2018. This is after he being on PD for four years and eight months. And uh, we we saw him while he was on hemodialysis uh, a year later in February 2014. This was on Valentine's Day, and this was, uh, was after he was actually drained four liters of hemorrhagic fluid. That is the gentleman who was on dialysis and he's still actually having this uh, hemorrhagic uh, drain uh, infusion. And this was a the tap. He kept on getting to repeat taps and uh, he required then wake up, more wake up for his hemorrhagic ascites. So the fluid was taken up, looked for cytology, which was negative for molecular cells. The CT scan that was done around that time showed a single abdominal parasternal uh, uh, a, a lymph node, which was negative for TB, negative for malignancy. Otherwise, they did not comment on the thickness of the peritoneal layer uh, on the CT at the time. What was noted was that he continued to have repeat a need for TAPS. So the interval for the TAPS kept on decreasing. Initially, he would take about two to three months before he needed a TAP, but then over time, it becomes two months and it becomes a month. And this is while he was actually going through his, uh, his hemodialysis. And this is what was done in 20. This is what happened to him actually. He say when he was at home before, uh, one day, he uh, the part of the abdomen where it was loose just popped and all this fluid just leaked before he could get to the hospital to get tapped. We tapped him around the time. And at the time we actually noted that he had a, an infected uh, uh, effluent with uh, a pterococcus vitalis. So at this time, we decided that we needed to actually then send him to, to the surgeon to actually have a relook as to what could possibly be happening into him, what it about bacterial translocation from the gut as well at the time. And uh, his uh, cultures came back showing that uh, the enterocus fecalis and uh, it was sensitive to vancomycin. So we decided that we are going to treat him with vancomycin during his dialysis sessions, but at the same time, get surgeons on board to actually start uh, uh, investigating him more and potentially uh, looking for any intraabdominal complications. So we asked the surgeon to have a look at this gentleman. Uh, they repeated a CT scan, which showed a large localized peritoneal connection, and the peritoneum appeared to be uh, largely fused uh, from the CT perspective. So the surgeon decided to go and excise this uh, uh, located uh, collection. Just like a ball in the abdomen, he removed that and uh, he, because the drainage kept on recurring, so he doesn't have to put a stomach back so that he can actually keep on draining continuously. And uh, after the surgery, the, 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 the need for taps lessens, so we no longer had to tap him monthly as we were before he was tapped. He responded well to antibiotics. The, 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 the infusion of the effluent decreased in volume as well. And uh, we noted that every time he had an infected uh, episode, he actually had more fluid coming from the abdomen. So we decided that you know, every time we see an increment, we actually culture. 
So we cultured every time we saw that there was an increase in a fluid that was drained and we treated according to the antibiotic sensitivities. At some point we thought we have already made up our mind that this is actually looks like uh, EPS. So we should consider treating it as such. Surgery has intervened and uh, we thought that maybe medically we can actually put him on tamoxifen, which is known that it can actually help decrease the fibrosis and also the, the, the fluid loss in the abdomen. We, in, Feb, in, in July this year, if you can see his blood results, he always had a low HB and uh, in July his HB was low and we, he actually had increased in effluent. In, 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 he was draining a lot of fluid. So we decided to culture this fluid. We cultured uh, a two organisms, protest mirabilis and uh, Klebsiella pneumonia. The two organisms were both sensitive to augmenting. So we decided to start in one augmenting for about two weeks, 14 days of augmenting. And a month later, his uh, profile had actually improved significantly. If you can look at this result, you can look at that. Uh, we don't have the latest the ferritin here, but you can, the ferritin has always been very high for the gentleman. He always had a lowish albumin with a, a poor nutritional status. But after treating this episode, we could see some, some do not significant, a slight improvement in his uh, nutrition status and also in, in, in his uh, hemoglobin. So this is a gentleman that prior to this complication, he has actually, we've actually identified a potential donor for him. In his son, he was an appropriate match for a living related donor. Uh, but because of this uh, uh, hemorrhagic diffusion, we decided to actually hold back on the on the transplant. So currently, he continues on his hemodialysis. Uh, he keeps on getting repeated episodes of infections. Uh, we we culture and treat accordingly, and he always has elevated in, in infection markers and also anemia, which we attribute to anemia of Kang disease. And this has led to a, what we call ESA resistance as well. He gets up appropriate doses of EPO, which don't actually uh, give us a, a response in terms of improvement in HP. And he has high ferritin as well, which means that we can give him a lot of iron as well to try to correct his anemia. So, but his anemia, once we actually treat the infection, we will tend to get a slight improvement in his, uh, in his, in his HP. And uh, because now I think the, the sensitivity to EPO improves a bit there as well. The nutritional status also improves with treatment and he's currently gaining some weight and feeling better once we are under control. He has a stomach bag that is actually currently draining but very little fluid. Uh, but if he gets an infection, you'll see that the volume of that will actually increase. So he has this repeat infection. So we don't really know what to do with the gentleman at this stage. We've taken him off the transplant list for now uh, until we can actually get to the bottom of uh, his problem. And we, we made an assessment of this gentleman to be having encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis as a complication of the recurrent uh, CAPD related peritonitis uh, during his long term uh, use of PD. And it's important, it's, it's a very, very important uh, uh, complications to know. It's not very common. Uh, we put through this the flow chart as to whatever this is taken from the paper by Munid, Medin, and colleagues. Uh, just to stipulate what is EPS. Prof, when we'll talk more about EPS, I just thought I could just put it as a summary so for those who want to. It's, it's usually get extensive thickening and fibrosis of the peritoneum, and this leads to the cocoon encapsulating the bowel. And usually, patients will present with intestinal obstruction. Well, a patient did not have intestinal obstruction, which is, which is good for him, uh, but in most instances, they present with intestinal obstruction. The incidence is very, very low. It's at 0 0.5 to 4.4 percent. It was first described in 1980 as, as a condition, and the risk factors could be PD or non-PD related. It's not just seen in PD patients; it can also be seen in non-PD patients. But in the PD patients, it's related to the fluid that we use, the high glucose, and the hysterilization, which actually leads to glycation. Uh, products for you. The non-PD causes your sarcoidosis, your malignancy in the abdomen, your peritoneal ascites, and use of beta blockers also could also be a risk factor. And it's also important to note that uh, uh, some of the risk factors also include the duration uh, of PD in people who are in PD for longer. It was actually well described in the Japanese populations. And the Australians also have a study that showed that the longer you are on PD, the higher the, ch the chance that you actually develop encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis. 
Uh, organ transplantation is also the patients, usually most patients are getting developed after transplantation. There's peritonitis is also the risk factor as we postulate in our patient. Younger patients, after filtration failure, these are some of the complicated the, the risk factors that we do. Some of the clinical features are what you can see early and late. And early, you can see in this anxiety, anorexia, nausea, vomit. Usually, these patients are malnourished uh, because of all the intraabdominal complications. They also can also be draining uh, this blood drained ascites, which is what we saw in our patient. And uh, late on, they can complain about abdominal pain, fullness, or red bowel obstruction, or they can have a mass. Our patient had a mass that needed to be excised by the surgeons. And uh, the diagnosis, I think, of when we go into that, usually we look at inflammatory markers, you have your radiology, and surgery can also be helpful. Sometimes you have to do your peritoneal biopsy for these patients. And part of the management is to discontinue PD. You have to support them nutritionally because they become malnourished. And this medical treatment is most of immunosuppressive therapy. You look at things like tamoxifen can be used. And then we can also look at other antifibrotic uh, agents that can be used. That's, uh, that's what tamoxifen has. Surgery is very, very important yeah, for this patient, especially, especially for a patient uh, who actually had this uh, recurrent uh, large uh, ascites that needed actually intervention. Sometimes you can do what we call peritone peritonectomy and anterior lysis. So these are patients with advanced disease uh, with actually some of them with obstruction. And uh, sometimes people talk about expiry date for PD, that if you use PD for a long time, there's a time when you need to consider switching because of, uh, but there's a question to this. You uh, know that some patients do well, very well uh, in P for PD over a long period of time. We need to consider using biocompatible PD freeze. I think this is something that is a typical topic. A uh, topic that has been discussed, and the use of ACE inhibitors as well has been postulated to also assist in preventing a uh, development of uh, EPS. And uh, this is some of the uh, pathogenesis that happens. Prof. Wen has nice slides on that. I think she will try to elaborate more. And uh, there's a case uh, that was actually presented in 2015 by the Tigerberg group of uh, encapsulating pretrasterosis presenting with uh, hemorrhagic ascites. This is after transfer from PD to HD. This is a patient who didn't have an EPS before transfer to HD, but one of HD they developed. I think if I remember very well, we also had a case like this in, in Hoske Hospital as well. There's a gentleman, I can't remember his name, I'm not going to mention if he was it, uh, who actually had uh, was on HD with the society, with hemorrhagic societies from EPS. Yeah, so it's something that you actually see, it's not very common, but when you see it, it's actually very, very important because Yes, uh, significant morbidity and mortality for implications for, for the patient that you're looking at. I try to go I try to go as fast as possible so that Dr. Prof. Wynn can have uh, enough time to elaborate more on the subject matter. Thank you very much. Can I hand over to you, Prof. Wynn? Thank you so much, Dr. Walter, for this very nice. Uh, interesting case. I mean, I hope that now the, the patient is more stable and uh, he's, uh, he's thriving right now. I really hope so. And um, just because it's very important to comment on this case, I want to present our speaker, who I'm sure that you're all very acquainted with her. We're talking about Professor Associate Professor Nicola Wern. Uh, Prof. Uh, Wern is the head of the Division of Nephrology and Hypertension at the Groot Shur Hospital at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, she is currently the secretary of the South African Nephrology Society, and she's a member of the African Society, Nephrology Society Executive Committee Chair, she's the chair of the Teaching and Education Committee, as well as the president of the Women in Nephrology Africa, the, re the recently at the division of Afran that we are very proud of. She is the head of both the HIV kidney service and peritoneal dialysis service in the division. She is currently completing her PhD, which is related to HIV and kidney disease. She has published widely in this area. Uh, Nikki has a strong passion for kidney supportive and palliative care programs in South Africa. And she was involved in the production of guidelines on this topic in South Africa. Uh, she is actively involved with the ISN and is responsible for managing the fellowship program in the division. Uh, Prof. Nikki is going to talk to us about this case, comment about encapsulated peritonitis, and about 
important causes of peritoneal dialysis complication. Uh, welcome and uh, please go ahead. Looking forward for your talk. Thanks very much, um, Prof. Um, can everybody see my slides? Just, yes, just a, yes. Great, yes. okay. Um, firstly, I want to say how lovely it was to hear Walter. Walter was an ISN fellow at Fritz Gear. Um, I was very lucky to be part of his training and it is just amazing to see the nephrologist that he has become in Botswana and uh, Walter, it is always so lovely to see you. So um, your case was very interesting actually and follows a lot of the uh, the ways that EPS actually does present, but um, and also you commented on some of the unusual things about the case. So I'm going to talk about important complications of peritoneal dialysis, um, just to remind all of us that the peritoneal membrane is an efficient, semi-permeable, endogenous dialyzing membrane. Glucose, as we know, is the main osmotic fluid. It drags fluid out with move movements of solutes down a concentration gradient. Now, the peritoneal cavity, the parietal peritoneum, constitutes 30%, lines the wall of the abdominal cavity with the visceral peritoneum that constitutes 70% that lines the gut and the viscera. So those of us who are advocates for PD, of which I am very much so, um, we know that PD is really a great first modality option for KRT. It's great in that in the first couple of years, we know that there is evidence that it actually, um, there is an improvement in mortality. Evidence supports protection of residual kidney function. It allows patients, which is very important for autonomy, improve, improve flexibility and quality of life. And very importantly, there, if you can manage it appropriately, there are no vas cats, which are associated with an increased mortality in all the central vein um, uh, complications that, are, that can occur. Uh, unfortunately, we do have restricted availability of hemodialysis in many regions where we practice, and then geographical distances makes hemodialysis a very big problem for many. So PD is a great first modality for KRT. However, the membrane can fail, and we in need to understand who is at risk and how can we prevent this. So peritoneal damage in PD patients, what happens is there is initial inflammation with angiogenesis, mesothelial cell transdifferentiation and mesial, mesial, uh, mesothelial cell death. And all of this impacts and causes sustained inflammation and fibrosis and can lead to peritoneal membrane failure, which is really uh, a very big problem for our PD patients. So... On review of the literature, the reported technique success of PD is shorter than that for HD, and transfer to HD is mainly due to peritonitis, inadequate small solute clearance, ultrafiltration failure, as well as social factor factors. An encapsulated peritoneal sclerosis may develop or progress, as um, Walter pointed out, after transfer from PD, to HD or transplant, transplantation. And this makes guidance about when to transfer patients very difficult. I do want to point out this extremely good article that I've mentioned here by uh, Edwina Brown, which is actually was, um, was published in PDI, The Length of Time on PD and EPS, a very good article to take home and read about this subject. So encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis or EPS is actually a potential but very rare complication of long-term PD. Walter nicely describes some of the uh, prevalence and incidence, but in, the, uh, in this uh, article by Edwina Brown, um, the prevalence is, is very low, but between 0.4% and 8.9%. Its incident rate between 0.7 and 13.6 per 1,000 patient years. And the risk of occurrence after five years on PD, which is the main risk factor for EP EPS, is between 0.6 and 6.6%. There is a high morbidity, morbidity related to bowel obstruction, and as Walter mentioned, for malnutrition, the reported mortality is very high, 
It's 50%, usually within 12 months of the diagnosis. However, this does depend upon the severity of the disease and not all deaths are directly due to EPS alone. And um, Walter alluded to this, but some believe that there should be a time limit for PD to prevent patients from developing this potentially devastating complication. Now, the pathogenesis is multifactorial. It can start with a prolonged exposure to foreign substances in the peritoneal cavity. Then there's inflammation and fibrosis with a chronic irritation that triggers an inflammatory response that may be initiated, as was discussed earlier, by a second hit of severe or multiple episodes of peritonitis. Walter's patients had a couple of episodes. Then there's inflammatory cell release, uh, release cytokines and growth factors. Fibroblasts are activated, leading to excessive collagen deposition. Uh, it, predominant, it predominantly affects the visceral membrane. However, it can also affect the parietal. And then you get this formation of encapsulating collagen and fibrin-rich fibrous capsule around the intra-abdominal organs. And the encapsulation process gradually encases the organism, organ, organ, organs, including the bowel loops, and this leads to obstruction and functional impairment. So um, you can see here that we have uh, an electron microscopy, uh, different stains of the parietal and visceral, uh, visceral peritoneum. But here on the bottom, you can see the encapsulating membrane over the bowel on the left. And then after, and you can see how it actually gets stuck down and actually becomes restricted. And here on the right, there's been resurgical removal of the fibrous membrane on the right. And this is a very important surgical strategy to assist patients with EPS. So very interestingly is that when you review the literature, most cases actually present after withdrawal from PD. This is in 70 to 90% of cases. And I do remember the patient that Walter was referring to at Tritiskia Hospital. The time for cessation of PD until EPS is reported up to five years. Early symptoms include bloody ascites, appetite loss, nausea, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Early EPS can present with an inflammatory state like fever, fatigue, weight loss, and elevated CRP, anemia, and hypoalbuminemia, which are all things that are reported by Walter's patient. So the progression, which was also very characteristically described in the case presentation, there was a stepwise progression of symptoms. And what happens is that these symptoms become more uh, closer in nature. It can progress to more severe symptoms of bowel obstruction, constipation, vomiting, abdominal mass, malnutrition, and weight loss. The symptoms often improve by temporarily fasting, but recur several months later. And it's this intermittent progression and therefore symptoms of EPS that's a useful distinguishing feature from other gastrointestinal disorders. And Walter very nicely described this intermittent progression where the episodes happen more frequently over time. It can be variable in severity, but may be life-threatening. So one can see bloody PD effluent or ascites. Scarring and inflammation of the peritoneal membrane can cause blood vessels within the peritoneal cavity to become more fragile and prone to bleeding. However, there is a differential for bloody effluent. And actually most of it is, um, the most common cause is actually trauma when one tags on the PD catheter, but also malignancy, um, Walter mentioned uh, per, uh, pancreatitis, also anticoagulation use and tuberculosis. And in women, retrograde menstruation and endometriosis can cause bloody effluent. So the diagnosis involves both clinical signs and symptoms, which may be of bowel obstruction and typical CT, CT findings, which I'm going to describe and show you in a minute. But basically there's a thickened peritoneal membrane, 
and intra-abdominal adhesions are common. Oh, what I was going to mention here, sorry, is that it's not just about the thickened peritoneal membrane and adhesions, which you can see with or without EPS. It may actually still occur when it uh, in the setting of tubercular, tuberculous peritonitis. So it's not diagnostic of, of EPS. One might actually see it after multiple episodes of peritonitis you also need the symptoms. So it's symptoms plus radiological findings. And if an opportunistic peritoneal biopsy occurs at the time of abdominal surgery, 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 it may also be misleading and should not be used to make a diagnosis because you need the symptoms as well. It's important to also, as we've discussed, to be clinically aware of the possibility of EPS for many years after stopping PD. So this is what it looks like, which is what I was alluding to. CT is recommended as the first investigation. Typical uh, findings include peritoneal calcification, bowel thickening, bowel tethering, and bowel dilatation. Importantly, as I've mentioned, radiological features or TCT alone does not suffice to make the diagnosis of EPS. One needs the symptoms. So the management does involve a multidisciplinary team. One needs the nephrologist. The surgeons become very important to release the restriction of the EPS. Patients become very malnourished. They need a dietitian. Nutrition is crucial. And I see that's what's happening with, uh, with Walter's patient. Long or short-term TPN may be required. If EPS does develop on PD, then a switch to HD is advised. However, some cases of EPS are clinically less severe and potentially can worsen upon stopping PD. And they actually say that having fluid in the abdomen might actually be beneficial for these patients and relieve their pain. Surgery is most effective when there is obstruction. Extensive adhesion lysis and excision of peritoneum while avoiding an enterotomy by an experienced surgical team is essential. So you need surgeons who are familiar with EPS. Ideally, and Walter, this is something that may be applicable to your patients, patients should be transplanted with three to four years of starting PD to reduce EPS risk, but the evidence also supports that patients with EPS can still be transplanted. So there are isolated reports of dramatic resolution of established EPS following kidney transplantation, as I just mentioned, possibly as a re result of immunosuppression. However, EPS can also develop following transplantation, a patient already receiving corticosteroids and other immunosuppressive agents. Other medical management includes continued ir irrigation, which might remove mediators of the peritoneal fibrotic process. This dual, dual PDHD, where there's a little bit of fluid left in the, in the abdomen, antifibrotic drugs, as uh, Walter mentioned, like tamoxifen and corticosteroids have all been used in practice, but the evidence is lacking for all of them. While some small studies and case reports suggest that tamoxifen might have potential benefits in slowing the progression of EPS and reducing symptoms, the evidence is not robust enough to establish it for as standard treatment. So really it's about prevention and identification. No single strategy to reduce the risk of EPS has been proven in clinical trials. Some evidence to support prevention of and prompt diagnosis and treatment of all types of peritonitis, minimization of high glucose PD fluid, use of biocompatible PD fluids, consider switching high risk patients. However, as we have mentioned, one doesn't know who is actually going to develop it and attempt transplantation early. So the risk factors, the single most important risk factor is time on PD especially after five years. It doesn't occur before three years as a, as a general rule. After 10 years, six to 20%. However, the majority of long-term PD patients will not develop EPS. So how does one know when to stop? Other risk factors include ultrafiltration failure, repeated episodes of peritonitis, and continuous exposure to high glucose PD solutions. So just to summarize EPS before I go on very briefly to other complications, EPS is a potential and rare 
complication of long-term PD. One doesn't really see it less than five years. However, most long-term PD patients are not affected. So should we be stopping it at all? The most severe clinical features of EPS with bowel obstruction, poor nutrition, and ascites may still develop even if PD is discontinued. Time on PD is the most specific predictor for the development of EPS. There's no robust evidence for any type of medical therapy. Surgery may be important to relieve restriction, which I think is very important. And reducing the risk is probably the most important thing that one can do as a clinician. So just moving on to the other major complications, and I'm not going to go into these in any really major way, but what other complications lead to PD failure. So catheter malfunction, although the catheter tip is positioned in the pelvis, it can migrate causing problems with drainage. Constipation is common and is the major cause of migration leading to poor drainage. There is usually no problem with the inflow. The problem is with the outflow of fluid. And it's important to have ensure good laxative use in all our PD patients. And just to point out, there's a catheter there in the in the uh, in the right iliac fossa, which is where it should be uh, uh, positioned. And here on the on the other side is a migrated catheter that's actually up in the abdomen, and you can see a lot of uh, constipation in this patient. The catheter can also become obstructed with kinks fibrin or blood clots. It can also get obstructed by adhesions or wrapping of omentum. Adhesions usually are associated with previous surgery or peritonitis. There's a problem with inflow. Management usually needs surgical review. And if adhesions are too widespread, then it's unlikely to get the catheter back into the abdomen. And then one needs to transfer to HD. The dialysis in the peritoneal membrane leads to increased intra-abdominal pressure and the magnitude of increased intra-abdominal pressure depends on the volume of the fluid, the position of the patient, with standing more than sitting, more than supine position, coughing, lifting and straining, as well as age and increased BMI. So here you can see very nicely the intra-abdominal pressure in the supine position, the green, is much less than the upright or the standing position. Hernias may result from raised intra-abdominal pressure. They are relatively common. They may present as a lump or a swelling. Sites include inguinal, paraumbilical, umbilical catheter insertion sites, other incisure sites, they may present as bowel incarceration or in strangulation. And here is some examples of hernias all in different positions. And the management really should be about trying to identify pre-existing hernias and these should be fixed prior to starting PD. However, sometimes they do not become evident until there is increased intra-abdominal pressure. Management is usually via surgical repair one must temporarily, dis dis temporarily discontinue PD and switch to HD. It is possible to resume PD very soon after its repair, especially if a mesh repair is performed. And then you must start with low volumes of dialysate in the supine position so, therefore, so as to not have increased intra-abdominal pressure. Fluid can leak from the peritoneal space through a congenital or acquired diaphragmatic defect into the pleural space. This will present as a pleural effusion. Any pleural fluid glucose that is greater than the serum is considered to be highly supportive of PD-related hydrothorax. There's no reliable cutoff of a figure of a glucose. And I must say my own experience has been there has been sometimes not very high glucose levels in the uh, uh, the pleural effusion, yet the patient did have a hydrothorax from a leak. So the presentation may be asymptomatic, shortness of breath, no improvement after good ultrafiltration, and typically a right-sided pleural effusion on x-ray. And the management is really about doing a therapeutic aspiration. Few patients, unfortunately, are able to go back to PD Occasionally, if it happens initially on the start of PD, you can do a period of rest and recommence PD with smaller volumes while that little hole actually uh, uh, seals itself off and then one is able to re resume PD. If the effusion recurs, 
um, the recommendation has been for pleurodesis. However, my personal experience that this hasn't been very good and has often caused a lot of pain with not a very successful outcome. So the infectious complications of PD are the nemesis of PD. Um, why do we worry about peritonitis? Well, it does lead to significant um, morbidity, some mortality. It accounts for 18% of infection-related mortality in PD. When we audited our service at Tritiscare, we found it to be the cause of death in 12.5% of PD patients, and we may need to remove the catheter, and it can lead to long-term ultrafiltration problems and may result in technique failure. Unfortunately, living circumstances can potentially put one at risk, particularly when there are water issues in certain areas. Um, I must say that uh, I have also, in on the other hand, had people living in quite uh, problematic living circumstances who do very well on PD. So I don't want to, um, to say that it is not possible. So how does one get peritonitis? Well, the route of entry can be intraluminal, can be periluminal, transvaginal, hematogenous, or transmural. Um, the main bugs are Staph aureus, coagulase negative Staph, E. coli. They're our main ones. And then uh, assorted, uh, assorted other uh, gram-negative bacteria, as well as candida, and then one gets a, a recurrent uh, negative culture, one must think about tuberculosis. The really problematic ones are pseudomonas, hold on a second, and fungal infection. I'm having a problem with my dog. You're going to have to wait one second. I'm going to have to let him out. Come on. Sorry about that, everybody. Uh, the uh, the problems of uh, of having uh, webinars at home. Okay, so they're the main um, the main bugs: pseudomonas and fungal infection. And then uh, difficult situations: pseudomonas can actually completely desecrate the peritoneal membrane. And here you can see what happens when you have pseudomonas. I've actually never been able to successfully put a catheter back in a patient who's had a pseudomonas peritonitis. So how do we diagnose peritonitis? Very briefly, we need a cloudy bag with increased white cell count, and hopefully, and we we try to aim for a positive bacterial um, gram stain and culture. So we need to suspect the peritonitis, we send the cultures, and then we treat empirically with broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, in our center, we use vancomycin, uh, kefetaxime or keftriaxone, and the evidence supports intraperitoneal administration of antibiotics, IP better than intravenous because it gets to the site where the infection is. So very important points to remember, Staph aureus, we should try to uh, protect against nasal carriage and um, treat uh, nasal carriage of Staph aureus with, um, with Bactroban or Mupericin. Um, we must ensure our patient's hands are very clean. Um, we must look out for the tunnel infection. They're often very problematic, usually Staph aureus, and is a, it is an indication to take the catheter out. So prevention is really very important. So successful prevention involves education and then retraining if there's recurrent peritonitis with regular technique and re-evaluation. Re and always we must always flush before field dialysis, which I think we all do these days. And then prophylactic antibodies, antibiotics are required if um, before we put our catheters and insert them either by the bedside or surgically. Importantly, it's about education, education, education. And when you think you're all done, you need to re-educate again. Education programs for peritonitis, lower failure rates, improved techniques, decreased peritonitis rates and improved compliance. So I think what I, uh, on, on that note, I want to end my presentation. Sorry about my very disrespectful dog, but um, I, uh, I think uh, the case, I'm going to stop my share now. Um, I think the case was extremely uh, an important one, Walter. It makes us 
think about EPS. I think we've all had that case of bloody effluent that we haven't quite been able to get uh, control of. Um, I want to open up the floor because this is a, a, an opportunity to discuss these cases. Um, and I want to thank you very much, Walter, for bringing this case to our attention. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. Nicola, for this amazing presentation. I mean, you did the impossible. You brought everything on the table in a very clear and concise way. So thank you so much for the effort. And I will ask uh, Khalida to actually lead the discussion because we should have uh, lots of questions and discussions about these very two presentations, very good presentations. Dr. Khalida. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Wan. I, I have enjoyed that presentation so much. Thank you so much, Walter. Um, uh, personally, my, my experience with peritoneal dialysis has been on my patient who came in from Cape Town. And then we switched him to hemodialysis. And he was very upset because we didn't have the, the ability to continue with PD. And he, his comment always, he's an advocate for PD for us because his comment always is you cannot compare the two in terms of his quality of life, his nutrition, the convenience for him, and in general, how he was feeling. So this is something we take very seriously and are looking into a PD program in Kenya. So thank you so much. I'll put the question to you, Prof, um, in terms of, can I ask? For you all in um, in Cape Town and in general in South Africa, and Professor Rasha, you can also comment on this. Um, and Walter, really, do you have a PD first policy or do you have an HD first policy? What is the policy in the country, and how do you think this affects your value of patients? So we we do have a PD first policy in our okay. centre. Um, we have at the moment seventy PD patients at any one time. Um, we have a large PD program, actually. Um, I must say, I'm a, I, I, I'm a huge advocate for PD. When PD goes well, it is um, patients, as your patient described, they they just want to do PD. They would, would rather do that than HD anytime. The problem is when PD does not go well, then it actually uh, it gives PD a bad name. And um, I don't think that PD is for everybody. I think if you had an opportunity to offer better education about who should get PD and not get PD, perhaps that is the right approach. We don't have the luxury. We only have, we have 155 to 60 patients on dialysis at Fritiskia, and there's only so many HD slots. So, you know, we don't have an option, but I must say, I think if I needed a dialysis, I would choose automated PD. And I think, you know, if one understands all the uh, the the good aspects of PD, I, I you know, unfortunately, the, we've got to grow it, as Russia is a big advocate for. So I think on that note, I'm going to ask Prof Darwish to give her comments on that. Well, uh, first you. of all, I totally agree. I mean, we are really great believers that PD should expand in the continent because not only we need it because we have some areas where there are no either no options of dialysis at all. So we believe that due to our geographical problems in Africa, PD would solve a major problem where it could be life saving. And the second thing is that, as you mentioned, if we have a proper education on how to do PD regarding nephrologists and patients, then PD will be done in a way where we have less complications that we have been talking about, and then it can continue. So it's not just about advocating PD, it's about doing it properly. And having said that, I'm having a question for you, Nikki. Are you picking patients in the clinics, for in the clinics where you follow up CKD patients? I mean, do you start talking about PD as an option on a, in, in, to patients who have chronic kidney diseases who are about to dialyze? Do you start there, or when do you start talking about PD? So, um, Rasha, I've got Bianca in, uh, luckily for me, I have Bianca in my low clearance clinic. So she manages the low kidney, the low clearance clinic, where we do start to talk about PD. We actually like them. Um, maybe Bianca can tell what she does, actually. You know, B, why don't you, why don't you um, uh, give a rundown of what you do in that clinic? Uh, sure. So we'll up and we'll ask the patients to walk with us to the PD unit where we'll introduce them to the sisters. 
we'll walk past the HD unit to get to the PD unit, which is quite um, strategic because they'll see a whole lot of people lying in beds connected to machines and you'll walk into the PD unit, which is obviously an outpatient service mm -hmm. and there'll be one or two patients there and they're sitting on, on, um, on, uh, on comfortable chairs. So we let them meet the sisters. They will often go and meet the patients and watch them do a bag exchange. And a lot of them have said to me, it's far less scary when you see it being done than when you hear it. So I think it is very, very valuable to get people to see what PD is and not just hear um, hear, um, hear, hear about it before they um, get to the stage that they actually need dialysis. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good strategy about taking them to the place um, I think it's very smart, uh, Bianca. So I love that. Um, I totally agree with you. There's a couple of questions on the chat I see, actually. I think you can take some of those. And um, yeah. uh, I think they're very relevant and pertinent questions. You can start with the first one uh, that I think any of you can. I have a patient who had, this is from an anonymous attendee. I have a patient who had clear effluent, complained briefly of abdominal pain, no cells on cell count, but on fluid culture uh, that is sent in a, a blood culture bottle has flagged positive, no ID yet. Would we then treat as peritonitis? And do you only opt to use IP if blood cultures are negative? Okay, so I'm just going to emphasize there are beautiful ISPD guidelines for peritonitis. They are hanging up in my unit. And I think it's it's lovely because it can help everybody. So anybody who has a suspect who is suspected of having peritonitis should be treated. So if you're worrying about it while you're waiting for the culture, you should treat it. But actually, the recommendation would be to stop if there is no positive culture. But saying that, it depends on how likely the suspicion is for peritonitis. If you have cloudy, bad, or raised white cell count, and I think from what I saw in the chat that I can't remember where the white cell count was raised. So the answer to that is if you suspect per peritonitis, you should treat it, and then you should send up another culture as a follow-up after you've completed your treatment. So that would be, and then just so that everybody has them all available to them, the ISPD guidelines do very, very nice uh, flow sheets of how one must treat all types of peritonitis. And I have all those flows up in my uh, in my unit. And I think that that would be what I would recommend that everybody does on this call. I think, Professor Wen, if you have those on soft copy, we can share them on the WhatsApp group. And yeah, uh, actually, I'll, I'm, um, sure, I'm sure they're downloadable. Yeah, they definitely, yeah. The, all ISP yeah. guide, ISPD guidelines, all of them are downloadable. And they come with a lovely, in. they've got lovely flow diagrams of exactly what you do and when to do it. So I highly recommend it. And they also tell you what to do if there's a culture negative or, you know, what antibiotic choice, whether you need three weeks, whether you need two weeks, whether you need multiple um, antibiotics. It, they're really, really great. So the ISPD peritonitis guidelines, which I think the last one was 2021, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So quite recent. Yeah, they even attacked the, the issue of having pets like your dog, Nikki. I mean, they, they tackled every single issue that you might face yes. in peritoneal dialysis. So I'm totally agreeing with you, yes. Yeah. I will definitely look those up and try and share them on the groups for us to have a look at. I'll move to the next question. Another one by an anonymous attendee, which was really interesting to me because I'd ask the same question. What's your take on improvising PD fluid in areas where there's scarcity of the commercial PD fluid? And I, this is interesting for me because we also have some patients um, who have failed vascular access on hemodialysis and we're using PD as a salvage using improvised PD fluid. And I heard, I think Walter mentioned something about biocompatibility in PD fluid. Um, maybe um, Professor Wern, you can comment on this and Professor Rasha, Professor Wern. And, and maybe we'll ask Walter also to, to come in there. But um, so we, unfortunately, um, PD fluid, look, we're lucky in South Africa, we have PD fluid that's manufactured in South Africa. The problem is, as soon as you are manufactured out of the country, every time you cross a border, you increase the cost and PD fluid is expensive. And unfortunately, as a PD community, we need to be working together to bring down the cost of PD fluid. I don't know how they're going in Botswana. So Walter, maybe you want to comment, but um, I don't have to worry about um, improvising. However, 
I do actually work uh, a lot with Minion McCulloch, who's actually a, a pediatrician. And she goes to many places and there are actually guidelines on how to put uh, PD fluid together. Um, I, I I can't remember which kinds of guidelines they are, but I'm very happy to share them on the group. I've got them somewhere of how you actually make your own PD fluid, saying that it is quite difficult to keep the sterility. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, and I think as a community, we need to be advocating for cheaper PD fluids. Maybe, Walter, you want to just give your, um, your input on what's going on in Botswana. No, no, thank you very much. I think in Botswana, we are fortunate that uh, we get all our fees from the manufacturers in South Africa. We use the same ad hoc and uh, Fresenia as fees. But I think I've, be, I've attended the sessions and I've been to Red Cross as well with Prof Mino. She talks through how to improvise. And I think uh, her improvisation really is centered around acute PD in general. Yeah. You know what, acute can injury cures a lot of people and you can make a difference. And if you look at it, it's for a short term while we are allowing the kidney to recover. Uh, it's not for long term PD. It's for acute PD. That's what and actually, you've just that's reminded right. me, Walter. Those those mm. guidelines are are the ISPD acute PD guidelines. Mm. You've mm. just reminded me. That's where mm. they are. Mm. Actually, sorry. It's, continue. It's, yes. Yes, it's difficult for chronic because once you go chronic, your risk of infection increases significantly every time you mix. But in yeah. acute, you are mixing, but at the same time, you are looking out. You know the risk is higher. You're actually anticipating that you may need to actually treat, but you are, you are thinking when the kidney improving while you are doing that, and then you stop it as soon as possible. So in Botswana, we Maybe are fortunate I'll ask. Yes. We don't I, have I know, the, I know. Yes, yes, go ahead, Walter. Sorry. Yeah, we don't, we don't have the PD first policy. Uh, we yes. use, uh, we, we just uh, prescribe kidney replacement therapy depending on the modality that we think is appropriate for a patient. Yeah. Uh, because our our dialysis, I think like in Kenya, is covered by the mm. government. So we don't have to yeah. Uh, yeah. worry about the 160 slots uh, for chronic. Thank you. Well, well, I agree. The problem is always the problem of the cost. I mean, when we're talking about PD in Africa or in low-income countries, we have the, the strange fact that PD is more expensive in these countries compared to other developed countries where PD is cheaper. So it's always a problem of manufacturing and also a problem of availability of good quality products at an accessible price. We are trying, of course, as much as we can as, uh, as NGOs to try to attack this issue. One of the things we are trying to do is to promote like some companies who are producing apparently good quality solutions at a cheaper price. Uh, we are trying to see if they can start um, providing these in the African continent. So this is one of the things actually with Prof. Edwina that we are uh, discussing with these people so that maybe we can solve this monopoly of these two huge companies and how they are keeping the prices very high in our countries. This is one of the things we are trying to do because so far uh, these companies are controlling it. They are uh, We are exporting water and water is heavy and once you're exporting heavy products, you're paying lots of money. And I know that in South Africa, even though you are producing it locally, it's not actually cheap, uh, Nikki, mm. right? So even the local production didn't solve the, the problem of the cost. So it's a huge issue, but I think, uh, I think there is hope in the horizon. Now with the new uh, manufacturers hoping that they are providing a good quality again, we're stressing on the good quality of low infection rate. Once this is provided, maybe the solution will be uh, finally there for our PD patients. But I think improvising is, as you said, a solution for acute cases and for a very short term. It's not a solution for PD in uh, in our continent, unfortunately. I, I think, Rasha, also just to mention, the more uptake and the more usage of PD, the, 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 the more likely we are to, to bring down costs. So we actually, as a community, have to also have an increased uptake. Yes. So, um, yeah, but I 100% I, I agree with you. I'm okay. loving this discussion. And um, I see we have lots more questions. So maybe oh, I'll okay. summarize a couple of them. Um, that we have uh, uh, Yahuza here talking about prophylactic measures to pre prevent EPS. And I'm, from what I have learned, I'm going to say for, for Yahuza Usman that probably um, we talked about a time factor 
we talked about dextrose concentrations and we talked about um, a recurrent infections um, uh, with preventing re uh, EPS. And um, there's somebody here, Amal, from Dr. Amal from Libya, where I know um, Dr. Professor Rasha has been uh, talking about an exit site infection with Pseudomonas um, in a baby in a three-year-old. Um, do you think our um, guidelines from ISPD will be able to answer this question if we share them? And I see Walter typing that. Um, so I'm just going to say that this is the time you really need to be aggressive. So if you have an exit site infection, particularly for pseudomonas, I think it, the exit site is addressed on ISPD guidelines, but you really, really need to be aggressive now because if that if that pseudomonas gets into a, to become a peritonitis, it's a problem. Now, some of the um, strategies that I've used have actually been uh, drops, like tobramycin drops, um, particularly for exit sites when they've got unusual sensitivities. So you can be inventive of how you actually treat that pseudomonas. So look at the sensitivity. If it's not sensitive to Bactroban or one of the other ones, you can use drops. I've certainly used them multiple times to uh, that can be eye drops or other types of drops just to treat the uh, the peritone to the, treat the exit side infection. So be aggressive and make sure you try to get rid of that exit side infection is my suggestion. Really, uh, that that is called experience, Prof. Um, uh, that doesn't Prof, come in any so guideline. Okay. Just, just, <laughs> Sorry, Walter. Go yeah, for it. Just to Walter. add, just to add, I think I think the other thing is if you get an exit side with pseudomonas, you must also worry about the channel infection. Yeah, sometimes you don't see it. You can sometimes be an ultrasound to see. Oh, the yes. collection along the tunnel. It may actually help you because now if the tunnel is also infected, chances are you are never going to get on top of yeah. your exit site. So you know. the, uh, Walter says an extremely important point. Not, not available to everybody, but you can actually see the tunnel infection with ultrasound. So if there's a collection under uh, but where the tunnel actually is and there's actually increased um, you know, fluid that's collected around the tunnel, it's time for the catheter to come out. And if you can actually remove the catheter and um, and clear the infection, then you can actually have a better chance of getting, to, to getting the catheter back in again. Actually, I'm very pleased that Dr. Amal uh, participated because Dr. Amal was one of the nephrologists from Libya who, uh, who participated in the Afran workshop in Tunisia because they are trying to support their PD program in, in Libya. And they are very enthusiastic. We have uh, an average of 50 new Libyans who joined Afran during the past month. So I'm very happy that you joined, Amal, that you are actually with us in this webinar, just welcoming you. Really, really happy to hear this. Mm -hmm. um, there, there is just a question, and this will be the second last question that we can answer very quickly from uh, Euphrasia. We currently have a pa patient with a 12 by 10 superficial abdominal collection found incidentally, and only seen now one month after PD was stopped for recurrent peritonitis. There is no EPS symptoms. And on Tona, it looks like a collection. Is this common? No, it, it's not. It's superficial, you're saying. It, it's not yeah. common. I, I've treated a lot of patients with the peritonitis. I mean, having a superficial collection is, is actually not that common. Um, Walter did allude to it, though. If it's around the tunnel, then, then that's a problem. So where the collection actually is is very important. But what you need to do is stick a needle in and you need to um, maybe need to drain it and just treat that localized infection. It is not a common thing, as long as it's superficial. So otherwise loculated infection, loculated uh, peritonitis, event, loculated infections that occur post peritonitis are not, mm, I wouldn't say common, but they, they do occur. And sometimes it, you know, they, they are more difficult to treat and often does mean mm. the end of PD sadly. I think they've already removed this patient from PD, so it's just treating that collection, but good to know also. Yeah. And then I guess there's a lovely, well-rounded question just to finish our session from Amir Muse, who says, and it's a wonderful question for the two of you, what should I consider if I want to set up a PD unit in a low resource setting? Uh, Professor Wen and then Professor Asha, what okay. is the advice that you would give? So my advice is that you need to get good training but your PD service is it's hundred percent essential. You get a good nurse, so you need you need to both of you be invested in a PD program. You need a great nurse. You get a, need a nephrologist who I would say who's a believer, who's supportive, who wants to make PD work. 
and the two of you can do it but you might need some training you might need to do some training to learn how to troubleshoot the problems you need to feel comfortable with pd and you need to be able to feel comfortable with the complications i think it's the those of us who are scared that actually stop us from doing pd but actually you know if you do enough of it you become for me i'm almost more comfortable with pd than i am with hd so that is where you need to try to work towards but we're always happy to help if you need a center where you need some training. Well, lovely. I love your answer, but actually mine will be more political. I mean, if we are in a low resource area, we'll have to be subsidization from the government because yeah. otherwise, how can you provide PD if you don't have a support from the government who will pay for the patients? So if you have a, a way to connect to your government, to, to convince them about how PD first policy is important, start doing the work and the connection, Politics in this uh, this area will be actually your main uh, start starting point. That's what I believe. And now, I, I, I actually I second that, Russia. I, unfortunately, yeah, I, I've got government support, so it's easier for me. But I hundred percent agree with you. Yeah. And actually, perhaps the stepping stone is ensure that you've got an acute PD program first. Exactly. So um, I I I should take one step back and be more holistic. But I think start up an acute program first and then move towards a chronic program. Totally. I have a small question for you that actually I'm curious about, Nikki. I mean, you yeah. said that usually EPS starts to appear a few years after the patient stops PD. Why do you think so? What's happening for it to, to start so late after PD stops? Um, I, you know, I Walter reminds me of one. I actually think I've had two cases in my career. So after seeing a lot of PD, I, I can actually only really think about two. And actually both of them occurred after PD. And both of them had multiple episodes of peritonitis. I just think it's a, a it's a, a lot of hits and um and uh what is going on afterwards, probably just ongoing inflammation, cytokines, and something has set up a second hit that's actually progressing. Um, I, I'm not quite sure, you know, it doesn't happen very, I don't think we should be scared by EPS because EPS doesn't happen that often, but um, there's definitely a second thing that it, that sets the ball rolling that I don't think we really understand yet. Mm -hmm. But it's very interesting and and thank you so much for all the work. It's, it's amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here, Rasha. It's lovely to have you. It's my pleasure. I'm so happy to have these comments as we wind up. Um, two women that I adore on opposite ends of the continent <laughs> and both executive of the women in nephrology and um, uh, yeah. Also, thank you so much. I want to say um, with a word, my nephrology fellow, that is Dr. Koge, is on this and she'll be visiting you and you must make her a PD expert and she should be coming in January. <laughs> So the two of you, shout out to you, mentioned to me, become PD experts. Um, I want to thank you so much, both of you, Walter, uh, Bianca, for your time and everybody that has attended um, our We have learned so much and the discussion has been so rich and amazing. Thank you so much. We're looking forward to having more um, uh, webinars from the YNC and we're looking forward to having more webinars about PD as we sensitize our nephrology community and uh, the fraternity at large. Thank you so much for it, Professor. Thank Russia, you, Walter. Khalida, for your work. Thank, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. And Thank you for having me. And